Um, okay, and now we have Louise Lawrence, who's going to talk about how they use their program to um, in Mortonshire. Thanks very much, Louise. Oh, hello. Um, I did speak on our pilot program at the last summit because we were just starting. So there is, we've got all the results, um, what we've learnt, and a few extra things that I've thrown in as well. So I'm the Education Officer for Moreton Bay Regional Council. We were one of the lucky councils to amalgamate in 2008. Um, we took on Caboolture, Pine and Redcliffe all amalgamated. We had three completely separate local laws, three pounds. Um, last week we've now got one local law. So we've gone from 108 local laws to six. It's a lot nicer. Um, we've got approximately 300, oh, yeah, 360,000 residents and approximately 70,000 children under grade 12 enrolled in schools across MBRC. So there's a huge opportunity for us to actually educate that amount of children. We've got um, just uh, or, yeah, around about the 70,000, I believe it's 69,980 um, dogs registered and we've got just over the 10,000 in cats. The cat only came in in the last um, year or so with state law to actually register, so that's why cats are still quite low. Okay, now the pilot program, we received um, $86,000 from state as one of the four councils that did receive funding. And the aim was to reduce the number of unwanted cats and dogs euthanised across councils. We chose cats as our main focus. One of our pounds had a 97% euthanasia rate on cats. Consistent for five years. So we had to make a difference on that. Um, there was a lot of things. We had a 2% claim rate on cats in this one particular um, region and that's a pretty low thing on cats in general. They didn't value them, they weren't of any um, you know, interest to people, it was just a, a throwaway item. So we really did the target on those. It took me a long time to actually go around to all the vets. I personally met with every vet in the area. Some wouldn't, there was only one that wouldn't allow us in the clinic, but that wasn't a desex thing, that was more of a council issue. Um, 30 out of the, or, yeah, 30 out of the 33 actually jumped on board. We also had two vet clinics from out of our region ring up and say, can we jump on board because we've got people coming to us? Fine, okay, some of them were on the borders. And what we asked them to do is during the weeks that we have our desexing um, weeks, that they offer a discount within their clinic. I didn't care what that discount was, it could have been a 10% discount, which they'd normally do for seniors. It could have been a 50% discount, whatever they wanted to do. They also had to provide free stitch removal um, for the people who actually came through with us. And if there was any post-op um, issues, they would actually be one of our vets that we would work with. And if there was any cost involved, because we were targeting low-income people, council actually wore any of the vet bills after that. So if they did need, you know, if the cat had pulled out stitches, council actually paid for them to get re-put back in, um, which was a big step from council, but it was also to show people that council was moving forward and we were trying to make a difference out there. And the other reason for that is the RSPCA facility um, was a fair drive for some people and a lot of people didn't have either the licence or they'd had it lost for a little while. Um, they didn't have a car or the car wasn't registered or they had no fuel. So there's yeah, a lot of different areas there. Um, now what we found was 92% of cats attending um, the sniff and chip had never visited a vet. Um, they might have as a, well, there was a few that had as kittens, not with the people who owned them. So with their current owners, 92% of them had never visited a vet. Um, it now gave that vet an opportunity to make a difference. We can only give them to their door, the vet then has to make, and the vet nurses have to make the difference to worm them and to educate them from there. Um, but we did have a really good rapport with the vets in our area. Okay, we were targeting the semi-cat owners, the ones who fed the cat, but nobody actually you know, really owned it. We asked people to step up and um, desex them. We held a $10 sniff and chip program. For $10, they got desex, microchipped and registered. Okay, we were out there to pretty much make a statement that we would. We had a lot of people ring up going, what's the hidden catch? There was none. Um, we learned a great deal from the booking systems with this. And we actually had a couple of really interesting success stories where one man in um, Deception Bay, which is one of our interesting areas, um, he had a lot of complaints from council regarding his dog barking. 
and he used to blame the cats in the neighbourhood. So he organised his whole street. There was 10 cats. He said he'd pay for them. He booked them in. He organised it with the owner. He drove the owners down, went out and got cat cages, desexed every cat in his neighbourhood <laughs> or in his street so that his dog wouldn't be barking because they wouldn't be fighting. <laughs> So, it, you know, it does work. We had one issue where it was really, really wet. We'd had half a metre of rain in the morning. Pause still continued, OK? We were thinking we were going to be sleeping in the pause unit and we had someone ring up and say, can you tell the policeman to let me through the roadblock? OK, so people were really trying to keep going. We introduced the Born to Survive um, program and we actually, cats have value. So this was put through the schools as well. And we used a couple of our people in our um, area that the kids could relate to. So we had the local fireman, and he's actually with Ben. And then we had Mother. Now, Mother is, at the time of this, was the president of the Vietnam Veterans Motorcycle Club. He's a big um, six foot six. He's a big bloke. Well, normally all in leathers, big Harley, and he breeds Abyssinians. And he's just got into Aussie cats as well. Um, so his abbeys would often be on the front of his Harley. The cages would be, you know, on the back and that sort of thing, going down and vaccinating and that sort of thing. So he was really good to take him to classes. Um, and the kids really didn't tell him the cats weren't cool. <laughs> okay. So we held, we went to just, we actually targeted our areas by issues. So the high impound areas where we were getting all the issues, we took them to. We didn't take them to the areas that were nice. Um, so we went to Deception Bay, Whamuran, Kalanga, Bribey, Morrowfield, Redcliffe, Rothwell, Orana Hills, Bray Park, Beachmere and Morrowfield. 50% of our people that came to all of our days came from Morrowfield. Um, that's one of our biggest areas. We learnt a lot, as I said, from the booking system. It used to go from just me taking phone bookings and booking them all in to going by um, the internet and doing online booking forms so I didn't actually have to get them to try and spell Smith because I couldn't understand them on the seventh time. Um, so it was something that was a lot easier and our call centre actually handled all the calls that people didn't have internet so they would actually fill the form out. The first, when we went to Morrowfield for the first time, we had 170 emails in three hours of opening the bookings. We only had 140 spots. Um, so we then booked those into the next one. The only one that we had a real problem with was the Kalanga one where we actually trialled a whole heap of different things with the pilot program. And with that one, we actually took bookings five months in advance because that's what council had advised that that would be the best thing to do. Um, so we did it and we had a 60% drop off rate. Cats had gone missing, um, cats had been hit by a car, cats were now pregnant um, and that sort of thing. So there's a whole heap of different things happening. As a result, throughout the two year pilot program, um, 28,000 children were visited, 4, 000, just over 4,000 experienced the RSPCA's EMU, we desexed 1,345 cats, we chipped 2,170 cats, we chipped 3,750 dogs and we had 2,600 new regos. Um, now with that we also hold chipping, so in the morning the cats would come in, first drop off we'd have A, B and C, drop off would be 6.30, 7 or 7.30 pick up would be sort of 3, 3.34. So they were broken into there. So we had half an hour to book in 10 people, half an hour to discharge. Um, so that's in the middle, other than help the poor staff, which that's pretty um, tight in there, so they don't, don't really want you in there, because um, there's not a lot of room. So we actually opened up and said, we'll just do $10 microchipping during the day, rock on down. Um, and they've certainly picked up a great deal. So that's where we did a lot. And people would bring their dogs and cats down. Um, with the state law, we now have to register everything we microchip. So if it comes down from microchip, it's got to be registered as well. But they're being taken. Most of our days, we would have had probably 50% of people turning up to a council day unregistered. Um, and they were happy to fill out the registration. We had one lady walk away because her cat, she didn't want it registered. Um, you know, we couldn't desex it and microchip it if it wasn't registered. That was part of the $10. We didn't um, means test them at all. If they wanted to show up, we did it. Um, we did have one lady, and it stands out like nothing else. She turned up in a car, and we were all looking, going, I'm sure that car wor is worth more than our house. Um, private school kids, out she comes with this cat, and she goes, no, nope, never been to the vet, it's a cat. Um, now, she would probably have never desexed the cat, um, didn't value the cat that much. So we actually did some work with the kids. 
We actually went to the kids' school and did a lot of work there because when they're in uniform, it's really easy to target the schools. Um, and that sort of thing, and hopefully we'll change that mindset. Okay. We had 40% males and 60% females. 15% were pregnant, 27% were in season, and 20% had had a litter before. We did have one that was over two years of age, just over two. It, the owner said it had 20 kittens. Okay. She said that they couldn't break the cycle. Okay. Got to keep the male away. Um, we had one come in that was pregnant, and we told them, that, you know, said it was early pregnant. She goes, but it can't have been. And I said, well, you, you brought in a male and a female. And she goes, well, they're both indoors, but they're brother and sister, so they wouldn't have. <laughs> so, again, there's a lot of, um, you know, <laughs> yes. Um, now, 30% were under six months, 40% were between the seven and 11 months, and 25% were over three. Um, we only had a few oldies with um, poor Ginger at nine. Um, <laughs> he, he got a lot of TLC that day. Now... Of people filling out the information, 22% had, had said that they'd had a vaccination. The majority of those were before the people had got them. Um, so, yeah, not too sure. 5% said they'd had full vaccinations um, and 8% had a dedicated vet. Okay. Of the owners that came in, they said 92% had never visited the vet. Okay. So, and this, when we showed the vets, and I... Every month I sent a letter out to the vets and I spoke to them on a regular basis. The people who were coming in were not their regular clients. Okay? Um, and if they sold them worming and educated them, we didn't guarantee that they're going to be A-grade clients. Okay? But it does give them a chance to actually make a difference. Now, all of our pores units seem to rain. We really liked the rain. This was Whamuran, um, <laughs> one of our setups. Um, this was our, our second time and we weren't fully prepared for the onslaught of rain and we didn't have good flooring. By the next time, we had it perfect. Um, and so the very first one... Oh, does it have a little... How do I do that? No, on the, the light. Oh, there we go. Oh, dear. That one. Too much technology. This one here was our very first one. Um, so, again, very limited setup. And then this was one of our later ones. We lost all our signage. Um, looking out, there was another one raining. Um, and for our microchipping, we actually used um, portable cat cages um, because people would turn up with cats in pillowcases, crab pots. They had to be in a cage. So we had cats stuffed into bird cages and trying to get them out when they're stressed was not fun. So we actually got the mobile thing for doing the microchipping. We chose really visible places like next to Wow, near Woolies. We found our most popular ones it had to be near Woolies or Coles. If it was near a Centrelink, we did really well. Um, and that's the thing, so it really showed that the areas had to be in a visible place. If you put them out the back where they don't really know where it is, they're not going to find it. So on a main road and actually advertising what you're doing. So we have um, star pickets and or little placards that have just got like $15 microchipping down the thing between a time. We don't take bookings, just come on down. Um, yes, it does get chaotic, but that's fun. <laughs> Got to have some fun. Um, this is the pause, um, just to give you a bit of an idea. So what we actually did was we had A, B and C. A was the first ones that you came in and then B was on your left, C was on your right. So as we're bringing the kitten cats in, we've actually put them in their cages so we know that a would get done first, they'd be the first ones home, then B and C. And that took a few to actually get a system happening um, and that sort of thing, but that worked really well. And just some pictures for you. We did try to keep cats together, so you'll see that one um, here. If cats came from the same family, they all went to sleep by, you know, together and they all woke up together. And we actually took some photos and sent texts to owners who were really, really stressed. Um, and that's the thing, people rang and wanted to find out, the same as they would in a vet clinic, so they had the same service. We had some negativity from vets, um, uh, mainly only a couple. The comments, one of, or there's quite a few comments that we had, but one of the best ones was the report that we were de-sexing de in the back of a trailer in a car park. Well, we were. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they just failed to sort of add in that it was the AVA-approved RSPCA trailer. Um, and that sort of thing. They told people if they came to us that we used bigger microchips than they did. Um, they told them that they wouldn't, we weren't registering them on a national database. 
and they said that if they bring their dogs will die because we're really mean and stress the animals out. Um, so we had a lot of people coming and watching what we were doing and we actually set the marquees up and everyone can see when we're microchipping. But it is really bad when you get the, you know, the 12-week-old foxy and all you do is grab the back of the neck and it starts screaming. And you're holding the needle going, I haven't done it yet. Um, or the big Maharotti that cries louder than anyone. I like those ones. Um, now, as I said, when we first started, we had a 97% um, euthanasia rate. I'm proud to say that um, figures were done um, a month or so ago and we're down to a 45% cat euthanasia rate. We have still got a long way to go, but we've certainly done a huge thing here by educating staff, working closely with the RSPCA, tailoring our pounds, and we're now operational out of one, um, giving the animals the best possible chance. And as I said, we still have a long way to go, um, but we're certainly a lot better off than we were two years ago. Um, we have around about the 22% owners come back and actually get or claim their cats. Again, that's going to take a long time to get that back up. We're on about a 60% for dogs. So we've still got a long way to go, but it is the educational part, um, the microchipping, the desexing. It's the whole package that we need to really look at. Okay, this was the emu. Some kids on board the emu. Um, so there's lots of things to be done um, on the educational mobile unit. Um, there's the vet section so they can pretend that they're doing um, these sex things. They can microchip. They can find cats in drains. Um, there's the chicken pen, the computers. There's lots and lots of things for them to do on and they did they really enjoy it. Now our PetSmart program. Um, this is one, as I said, we've got 70,000 cat, oh, kids, cats, 70,000 kids in our um, region. I'm the only education officer. I can only do so much. Um, so we've started a brand new program, which is kids teaching to kids. So instead of me going in and teaching the whole school, I'll go in and teach grades six and sevens, and then the six and sevens have to teach all the other kids. Um, and then I go back and work with them at certain times and take the dog in, because obviously the dog's not allowed to be left with the kids. Um, Smash is our education dog, and I'll show you what he's done in the last few um, years. Our main aim of PetSmart is to reduce the number of attacks that we see, to increase pet responsibility, um, and we teach them to safety, that they've got to hide their sausages, their fingers, even grade eight and nine has a different take on that, um, but as we say to them, it's sausages. Um, they've got to stand up tall, look down and freeze. And we talk from the under threes in kindies up to grade 12, and we do adult education as well. Smash now has his own email address, um, he's not on Facebook, haven't figured that bit out yet. Um, we tell the kids that Smash has got this really big keypad so his paws can fit on it. Up to grade three, they're believing it. Um, and we've got Dob in a Dog program. So Smash heads up our Dob in a Dog. So if a kid's walking to school and a dog scares them or they know of a dog that can put its head over, under or through a fence, they can email Smash and Smash actually directs an officer to go out. The officers love it, um, being directed by a dog. Um, They've got to go out and do fence inspections. And we had a nine-year-old boy email at nine o'clock one night. He'd convinced his parents, because a lot of time parents don't want to talk to council, he'd convinced his parents to actually let him email Smash. And we don't want names, addresses, we just want to know where the dog is. It was two massive Roddies who constantly jumped the fence. Um, when we actually directed the officer, the officer went out. The dogs actually... Um, ruined his pants, they ripped them, they shredded one of them, um, and that sort of thing. One was actually impounded because it actually ran after the vehicle. Um, it had knocked down the chicken fence, the chicken wire fence, um, and the smallest Roddy was 62 kilos. So these kids were frightened, um, but no one wants to complain. So Smash is one of our mascots out there now. He should be on stress leave, because he's visited just over the 50,000 children. Um, so each year he actually comes out, he works pretty much Monday to Friday, he doesn't do events and he doesn't do fates, that's just too unpredictable. But he'll start in the morning, he has a hydro bath before every visit, so he's the you know, nicest smelling dog except for when it's raining. Um, and we go through pet ownership, local laws, dog safety, we've added in a few programs, PetSmart goes wild and we take Billy the Wombat and some snakes with us into schools. Um, we're looking at a PetSmart Gets Wet program, introducing native fish gardens and ponds and that into their gardens, and a Koala Smart program is coming up very shortly. So SMASH does a lot of different things there. Um, 
and we've got our Cat Smart program that Smash actually does talk about. And these are our two mascots. So we've got Cooper with his pooper scooper. I don't know about naming competitions. And Marmaduke the Marmalade Moggy. Um, so they were basically our mascots throughout the, the whole time. And if, you know, Smash is replaceable as well. So he's our fourth education dog. So if he decides, well, he's four, so another couple of years and he'll be retiring um, and a new dog will be training up. So rather than actually having, you know, Smash at the front of everything, we try to put our mascots. That's my van. Some of you did see it last time. Um, and it's basically got all of our messages on there, snip and chip. Um, register, pick up your poo, walking on a lead, cats in an enclosure so that they're safe, all the messages that we need um, and the kids, you know, can see it every single day because I'm out and about a great deal. Just a couple of things on the PetSmart. We introduced um, some little cartoon characters and things like that, but we've got, this is what happens with local laws. Um, so you can see the cats in a cage. Um, bit, sorry. Um, cats up here in an enclosure and that sort of thing and everyone's doing the right thing and then we've got without local laws so it is something that's just a little bit different for the kids to understand that the cats do have to be on their own yard the dog has to be as well and we've got one really simple message out there that no animal can put its head over under or through a fence so whether it's a horse it can't eat the neighbor's trees a cat can't leave your property a dog can't go over under or through either okay so it is really simple for them <clears throat> on our website, we've actually got a teacher's resource page that's got a lot of different activities. Um, we've got the I'm Alert program. Some of you may have seen the fire safety I'm Alert and the food safety I'm Alert. There's now a dog safety I'm Alert. We've put all everything on our website so that I don't have to visit every single time as such. They can do a fair bit by themselves and then I can just go in and do a quick refresher and that sort of thing. Now, I've just got one, our dog safety song will be coming up very shortly, um, and that's the end of my presentation, so I'll just let you listen to this. This only goes for 90 seconds. Although a dog is man's best friend, he won't be friendly if you intend to pull his tail or grab his skin. 